I can identify Hello. all three. Hello. Hi. <laughs> this is Cindy. This is Cindy Bramlich. I don't know where I am in my little phone. Can you see the screen with the uh, the three sisters and the title? Yes. Then you're good. Yes. Okay, everyone. Um, welcome to Northern Kentucky History Hour. We're going to get started. Um, thank you for joining us. It's my pleasure to welcome you to Northern Kentucky History Hour tonight. I'm your host, Heather Cook. Um, Northern Kentucky History Hour is a project of the Barringer Crawford Museum, Northern Kentucky's History Museum. Barringer Crawford Museum is supported in part by the City of Covington, Kenton County Fiscal Court, Arts Wave, Kentucky Arts Council, Northern Kentucky Sports Hall of Fame, the Carol Ann and Ralph B. Hale Foundation, um, Junior U.S. Bank Foundation, and our members. If you're not yet a member of the museum, please consider joining for access to discounts and exclusive programming. You can learn more at our website, bcmuseum.org. Um, I would highly recommend becoming a member if you've ever been to the museum. You do know that there's always something new there to learn and to see, and the community that you will become a part of is just amazing. Um, before we begin, we do also have a few reminders tonight. Everybody's microphone has been muted um, when you join the presentation so that we can all focus on the program. You can feel free to turn your video on or off, depending on which you prefer. But if you do choose to have it on, others on the call are able to see you even while the screen is being shared. Um, if you have a question or comment to share, please type it in the chat and we will try to get to as many questions at the end of the program as possible. Um, there will also be a trivia question tonight. So the first person to enter the correct answer in the chat will win a Northern Kentucky History Hour pin. Um, so let's meet tonight's speaker. We have Dave Schroeder with us tonight. He's the 2017 recipient of BCM's Two-Headed Calf Service to History Award. He was named Executive Director of the Kenton County Library in 2007. He was previously was archivist for Thomas More College and the Diocese of Covington from 1996 to 2000 returning to KCPL in 2000 as the Kentucky History Librarian. He serves as president of Board of the Friends of the Kentucky Public Archives and is a past member of the Kentucky Archives and Records Commission from 2007 to 2018. Schroeder is the past chair of the Kentucky Public Library Association and past president of the Kentucky Library Association and chair of the Kentucky Public Library Association Advocacy Committee. He's also a member of the American Library Association Advocacy Committee. Uh, Dave, welcome. Thank you. Um, we've got a very broad topic to cover tonight, and uh, so I can't get into great detail, but I will do my best to, um, to get through as much as I possibly can uh, in the time we have allotted. And I will try to identify the sisters um, that I have chosen photos of. Most of these photos are from our online archive. Uh, if you go to the Kenton County Library webpage or Google uh, Faces and Places, it's called. It's our photographic archive. We have 120,000, give or take, photographs online, fully indexed. So if you're interested in old Northern Kentucky photographs, um, it's a great place to, um, to just uh, look for old photographs. So um, I would encourage you to do that. Uh, the sisters on the um, on the title slide are Sisters of Divine Providence. They were uh, leaders of the community at one time. It's um, from left to right is Mother Mary Felicity, uh, Reverend Mother Anne Marie Birchmans, and Mother Antoinette Marie. And we'll we'll talk about the CDPs um, in a in a few minutes, and we'll talk about the the title Marie as well with the CDPs, which is a little different than the other sisters. So, okay, why is it not, oh, okay, here we are. So uh, the first order of sisters to come to Northern Kentucky were the Sisters of Charity of Nazareth, not to be confused with the Sisters of Charity in Cincinnati. Sisters of Charity of Nazareth are from Bardstown, Kentucky, uh, just north of, um, well, it's, um, uh, they're from a community called Nazareth, which is actually a, a community unto itself just north of Bardstown, uh, which is now in the Archdiocese of Louisville. 
Um, and they are really one of the first truly American orders. And when I say that, I mean that they were established in the United States. They really were not established with European pies. Uh, they were established as a local community in 1818 on the Kentucky frontier, so very early on. They're one of the first American orders in the United States. Um, their founder was Mother Catherine Spalding. So if you're familiar with Spalding University in Louisville, that's Mother Catherine. Um, she also had two nephews uh, who became bishops. Um, and so her family was very well known in the Nelson County, Bartstown area. She was from that migration. Her family was from that migration from uh, Maryland over the mountains into Kentucky in the late 1700s. So her family has deep Catholic roots in the United States. Um, and so the, the sisters, uh, again, uh, had no European ties. Um, and the, the other thing that you will notice about the Sisters of Charity is their habit. They had a very distinctive habit um, in that they wore bonnets, so they didn't have the traditional veil. Uh, and the Sisters of Charity in Cincinnati, who were kind of uh, cousins of the Sisters of Charity of Nazareth, they had bonnets as well, but theirs were black. So uh, the white bonnet um, made the Sisters of Charity of Nazareth a little bit distinctive. Um, Mother Catherine um, chose a habit that um, was uh, almost the garb of a, of a widow during the time period on the Kentucky frontier, and she wanted something that the, the sisters could work in easily. Many of them were doing farm work as well as working with the poor, working as teachers. Um, they ran an orphanage. They did all kinds of things, and so they had a very, uh, a very simple uh, and very plain uh, habit. Um, they were brought to Covington in 1856. Actually, they agreed to come to Covington in 1856 at the invitation of Bishop uh, George Aloysius Carroll, who is the first Bishop of Covington. He was a Jesuit. He had come to Covington when the diocese was established in 1853. And the first thing he saw was that there were, uh, there were three schools in Northern Kentucky and there were no women religious. Um, and so he invited the Sisters of Charity to come to Covington and establish a school, or actually take over the Cathedral Elementary School. Um, and um, you'll see on there, I have a Sisters and Bishops, sometimes a rocky road, and I don't mean ice cream. Um, there's always been conflict um, here and there, especially in the early days between religious orders and the local bishop, where they didn't always agree. Um, the sisters, um, in this case, um, when they were going back and forth with Bishop Carroll, there was discussion about uh, the sisters just wanted to take over the parish school, which they referred to in the records of the time period as the poor school. So it was the school where the children in the neighborhood school. Bishop Carroll told them that they would not be able to make a living by doing that because the children would not be able to pay enough in tuition. And so he wanted them to open an academy as well as take over the parish school. Um, there were lots of letters that have gone back and forth. They're in the archives in Nazareth. And uh, I went down there and looked at them. They're, they're fascinating letters going back and forth between the bishop and, uh, and the mother superior at the time. Um, and um, talk about you know, the differences and, and, and why he wanted an academy and why they wanted to do the poor school or the parish school. They finally decided to do both. So um, this is a sister later on. I, this is the one sister, I don't know her name. So if anybody knows her name, put it in the chat. But you can see the bonnet. Um, this is a more modern photograph. Of course, it's probably from the early 60s or late 50s where they're still wearing the bonnet. They established La Salette Academy. And if you're looking at this map, this is a Sanborn map. You'll see this is 7th Street. This is 8th Street, we're in Covington, and here's Greenup, and over here would be Madison. So the, the original cathedral was actually on 8th Street. So this is not the cathedral we're aware of today. This is the first cathedral. It was on 8th Street, faced 8th. The parish school actually faced 7th. And in between, it says Sisters of Charity. Actually, this is mismarked. This is not their residence. This was actually the bishop's house. The sisters were living in the original academy building, which, the, the, which is this building back here on the corner. 
at 7th in the alley behind Greenup. The Lost Lot Academy we're all familiar with, this building is right here on this corner even today. It's no longer the academy, it's a, it's a, a home for the aged. It's right here. The original Lasselet and the convent is this building on the alley. So this is a map from 1886. So this is uh, three, 30 years later, the sisters were still running the academy and their house out of this tiny little building in the back. Eventually they would build this building um, and then eventually next door, the modern high school, which was built in the 1930s. That's the high school my mother would have attended in the 1930s. And that was the last high school uh, when the academy closed in 1977. Now the Sisters of Charity, because they were a, a, a local, uh, an American order, they tended to draw young women who were American uh, born. And so they were women who had been in this country for many years, um, they spoke English. Um, and so when you look at the sisters and where they served in Northern Kentucky, it's very interesting because um, the Sisters of Charity tended to serve in the English speaking parishes along the river. So if you were taught by the Sisters of Charity, you were more than likely um, in an Irish parish school. So I've listed some of those here on the side. So you see Immaculate Conception in Newport. This is the old Immaculate Conception Church before the 1915 tornado, which took off the steeple. The steeple was replaced. And this is actually the la uh, one of the last faculties at Immaculate Conception. They also had an academy in Newport up until the 1930s, uh, right around the right next door, actually, to uh, Immaculate, Immaculate Conception Church was Immaculata Academy, and behind it was the school. They had St. Patrick in Covington, St. James Elementary and High School in Ludlow, St. Anthony Bellevue. All of those schools and the cathedral were all the traditionally Irish parishes in Northern Kentucky. So again, if you went to a school that was taught by the Sisters of Charity, more than likely that was an Irish parish at one time. They did eventually take on some other schools uh, in the Burbs. So uh, St. Catherine and Fort Thomas, All Saints, they were, um, involved at Thomas More University. They were not one of the three founding orders, but they did have the sociology department. And they also, um, one of the sisters served as Dean of Women. Um, so they were involved at Thomas More. Um, they were very involved in founding Brighton Center. Um, and so the Brighton Center that we know of, that's all throughout Northern Kentucky, the Sisters of Charity were amongst the earliest uh, all, all the orders in Northern Kentucky actually took some part in Brighton Center, but the charities actually had uh, sisters on staff at the Brighton Center at one time. Um, shifting demographics um, in Northern Kentucky actually put, played to the deficit of the Sisters of Charity in that many of those Irish parish schools were on the river. And those were some of the ones that closed when people started moving out into the burbs. Um, I was probably the last generation of young people um, taught by the Sisters of Charity in Northern Kentucky. Um, the sisters were at St. James School where I went um, up until my um, seventh grade year and then um, the last sister left and I think she was probably the last or the second last um, Sister of Charity who taught in an elementary school in Northern Kentucky. That would have been early 1980s. Uh, very early 1980s. So um, Sisters of Charity were here basically as teachers from 1856 through the early 1980s. Um, again, you'll see the bonnets. Eventually they switched from bonnets to veils and then eventually um, uh, went to traditional um, clothing that you know women would wear in general. Um, they were actually the first order uh, in Northern Kentucky to uh, make uh, habits optional. So they were some of the first sisters to, um, to have an optional habit. So uh, all the sisters that taught me at St. James, for instance, that I remember did not wear the habit when I was in school. So when I went to other places and saw sisters in habit, that was different for me because the sisters that taught me didn't wear habits. The next group of sisters who came to Northern Kentucky were the Sisters of St. Benedict. They came in 1859, so three years after the Sisters of Charity. 
they were German, so they were from Eichstadt, Bavaria. Um, so um, they came um, with uh, strong German roots. Um, and uh, they established in 1859 a convent in Erie, Pennsylvania. Um, and then uh, they also uh, established uh, in 1859 St. Walburg Monastery in Covington. I'll show you where that's located in a minute, um, the original St. Walburg. Uh, the photo, uh, the first photo is Sister Mary Walburg. She was the first uh, woman in Covington to enter the Benedictine order. So she was given the name Wahlberg. She was Sister uh, Wahlberg Salinger. Um, the, the photograph next to her, I'm not sure who she is, uh, but she is, it's an old, one of the older photos of the sisters um, that are existing, but it shows the habit uh, when the sisters uh, early on um, and how it changed a bit. So you'll see the, the, the change, especially in the veil area, um, that the part around the neck was actually pleats. And talking to the Benedictine sisters, I said, what happened in the summers when you were teaching to those pleats, those starched pleats? And one of the sisters laughed and she said, after a very hot and humid day in Northern Kentucky, that coif or that, the, 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 the collar would sag over time and stretch because the starch could no longer hold up because you're wearing this um, garb and when it's that hot out, you're sweating. Um, and so um, it's interesting how um, the habits affected um, the sisters and vice versa. But um, you can see um, how the habit changed slightly over time. Um, Sister Alexa Lechner was the first prioress of the St. Walburg Convent in Covington. Um, so she would be the foundress uh, of, the, uh, of the Covington Benedictines. She's buried at um, Mother of God Cemetery along with many of the original sisters um, before they actually built a cemetery uh, out in Crescent Springs. So the earlier Benedictines are buried at um, Mother of God Cemetery. They came to staff St. Joseph's School for Girls, which they did. They also started an academy it's called St. Wahlberg Academy. They staff St. John Orphanage in Fort Mitchell. They were also the founders of Villa Madonna College in 1921. Now, I think this is an important note. Um, 1921, young women, particularly young immigrant women or young women of the middle class or uh, uh, not middle class, you know, that were uh, from the poorer classes, the opportunity to finish grade school was an accomplishment for many of those women. High school uh, was inconceivable for many of them and college was not even thought of by many of these women. But there were women who did aspire to more education and wanted education and Catholic women had the option of entering a religious order. Um, and the Benedictines um, were amongst the first in Northern Kentucky to start sending sisters to earn higher degrees. And so when they started Villa Madonna College in 1921, they had a number of sisters who already had master's degrees and some that were already working on PhDs. Now in 1921, women with master's degrees and PhDs in this country were still very rare. Uh, and so sisters uh, had an opportunity to, um, to, to earn that kind of level of education uh, that many women would not have. I think it's also important to note that um, the first president of Thomas More College was a sister, Sister Domitilla Thuner. Um, she was the first as I said, she was the first president, the first, they called her Dean in those days, but she would, she filled the role of president of Villa Madonna College. And so um, the sisters eventually in 1929 started working with the Sisters of Notre Dame and the Sisters of the Divine Providence, and it became an inter-community college, a diocesan college sponsored by all three orders. But for the first eight years, it was the Sisters of St. Benedict that started Villa Madonna College and um, gave it the foundation that it still stands on today. And Thomas More is actually 100 years old. So um, it's been 100 years since the uh, Benedictines were upping their game. I think it's also important to note with all of these orders, before there was a college where they could earn a degree in teaching, um, many of them used an apprenticeship system. So when a, when a young woman entered the convent and 
most likely was going to become a teacher because many of these orders were teaching orders. Um, an older sister would teach her how to teach. So the older women of the community were teaching the newer, younger members how to teach, the craft of teaching. And so it was this apprenticeship. Um, and it was not until um, state, regulation, state regulations came in and uh, there was uh, stronger um, uh, rules about you know, what you needed to teach. Um, and that's really one of the things that got the Sisters of St. Benedict to think about, we need a college in Northern Kentucky to teach teachers. And so many of the nuns that taught us on this screen today are with us today. Um, went through Villa Madonna Thomas More College um, uh, and received their teaching degree that way. Many of them on nights and weekends, and it took them years, um, sometimes a decade to get their bachelor's degree, and then they went on and got master's, many PhDs. Um, so these were women that were highly dedicated to their craft, highly dedicated to teaching, um, and to whatever uh, discipline they were in. Many were nurses as well, which we'll talk about. Um, here is a map of uh, the original St. Wahlberg convent. So here's Greenup Street, you can see, and here's Scott. This is 12th Street. So the cathedral would be right about here. Here is St. Joseph. It was a German parish. And here is the girls school that the Benedictines came to staff. They eventually built their, their convent next door and eventually built their academy, St. Wahlberg Academy next door to it. The, the, the parish was run by the Benedictine priests who lived in this priory behind it. Also on this property was the Catholic Art Institute that was founded to build altars and other church furnishings for churches throughout the Midwest. Um, Johann Schmidt, who did a lot of Catholic uh, art in Northern Kentucky, taught here and worked here and taught Frank Duvenac, who was the, the most famous artist uh, out of Covington by far. Uh, Duvenac also received his early uh, art education on this campus. Um, eventually, a new parish school was built on this corner. That building still stands. It's the Biggs Early Learning Center. It's part of the Covington School District. The rest of this property was all demolished in the early 1970s. So this is all parking. Uh, the parish had decreased in size. The sisters had moved out to Crescent Springs. Um, the college had moved out to Crestview Hills. And so um, the, the, the neighborhood had changed so much that there was no longer a need for a parish and the cathedral was a block away. So unfortunately, St. Joe's and this whole block is gone. But you can see the Benedictines had a huge number of schools and some of the biggest in the diocese, Holy Cross Great School and High School, St. Henry Great School and High School, St. Paul, Blessed Sacrament, St. Pius. Um, some of the major schools in Northern Kentucky, the sister staff. They also had Good Council School in Covington, uh, which was kind of a shared institution. I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, they had Madonna Manor, which was a home for the age, still exists, of course, in Villa Hills. Um, they moved out and established uh, Villa Madonna Academy in what is today Villa Hills. So um, the sisters um, had a great impact on education in Northern Kentucky, just like the Sisters of Charity. Um, they were primarily in German speaking parishes, but not exclusively. So you'll see many of their early parishes were German speaking parishes. They were from Bavaria. And so uh, that made it very convenient for them to teach German children. Um, the other thing about the Sisters of St. Benedict that I think uh, is, is very interesting is that early adoption of, of formal education for their teachers to teach. Uh, I think that's something that uh, is a hallmark of the Benedictines in particular. Uh, come on. Not letting me go to the next one. Oh, there we go. So here's a picture of that complex. That's St. Joe's Church. Right here is the girls' school. Here is the original St. Wahlberg Monastery. Here is the original St. Wahlberg Academy. This became in 1929 Villa Madonna College's main building and remained their main campus building until they moved out to Crestview Hills in the late 60s. 
Now, the photos here, this is Sister Wendelin Burkhart, who was a uh, sister of St. Benedict. She uh, was very active in working with um, children with disabilities. She was uh, very active at um, Good Counsel School, which was a school established for children that had um, disabilities of some sort or another. Uh, other nuns worked also, some Notre Dame and some CDPs also uh, were involved in this work, but Sister Wendelin was the one that was most identifiably noted, uh, um, most identifiable with that group at Good Council. The Good Council School was housed in the old Mother of God School across the street from the church. Uh, the photo of the two sisters here at Villa Madonna Academy are, this is, uh, let's see, Sister Mary Judith and Sister Mary Andrea. Um, this is a nice picture of the Villa Madonna girls getting ready to graduate. They still wear their white dresses and their hats, which is a long tradition at the Villa. You can see uh, the property. This was uh, one of the original farmhouses on the property in Villa Hills, which is still stands. This is the original academy, and this is the current high school elementary school. So nice aerial shot. Um, I've, I've, I've always included on with each order a, a sister who's currently working today, this is Sister Deborah Harmling. Um, I included her because for two reasons, well, three. One, she's just a nice lady. Two, she's a librarian. Three, she's an archivist. So she's, she's high on my list. Um, uh, love Sister Deborah. she's a, a sweet lady. Um, she's been uh, very good at preserving the history of the Benedictines in Northern Kentucky, and she's a librarian, so what more can you say? So next group, 19, 1861. So you see we've got 1856, 1859, 1861. So Bishop Carroll is lining up these religious orders to come to Northern Kentucky to fill needs. The first two groups were education. This next group, the Sisters of the Poor of St. Francis, came to open a hospital. They actually uh, established um, St. Elizabeth Hospital in 1861. They had only come to uh, Cincinnati a few years before, uh, but there was a woman in Covington named Henrietta Cleveland. She was working closely. She was a very wealthy widow. Uh, she saw the need for health care, especially for the poor in Northern Kentucky. She worked very closely with Bishop Carroll to bring the Sisters of, uh, of the Poor to Covington to start a hospital. There was no hospital in Northern Kentucky before 1861. If you were sick, you went to Cincinnati or more likely your family took care of you. Um, so the sisters actually agreed, uh, they were running St. Mary's Hospital in Cincinnati. They agreed to cross the river uh, and to open St. Elizabeth in 1861. Uh, the interesting part about St. Elizabeth Hospital, even though it was on the south side of the river, so technically we were a slave, we, not technically, we were a slave state in 1861. The war is going on, the Civil War. The sisters made it very clear from the start that they would be an integrated institution. They accepted African-American patients, they accepted Protestant patients, they accepted Jewish patients. And their records, we have their original admittance books at the library starting in 1861 through the 1940s. So everyone who is admitted into the hospital during that time period, we have those records at the library. Um, and they made notations of the religion of the person who was in the building um, and uh, why they were there and when they were admitted and those kinds of things. Um, so they're great for, um, for genealogy use and that's why we have them at the library. Uh, the hospital gave them to us before HIPAA, so we didn't have to worry about HIPAA. Um, and so, and they're, all of these people are deceased of course by now. Um, but they're great records. Uh, Mother Frances Chivier is her name. She was from Aachen, Germany. She founded the Sisters of the Poor. Um, and uh, she is now a saint or on her way to sainthood, I should say. I don't think she's been, well, yeah, she has been declared a saint, uh, I believe. Yes. Uh, and she was uh, present when the, um, when the second hospital was built, which I'll show you in a minute. They were originally located on 7th Street. So if you know where the Covington School uh, main school offices are on 7th Street across from the old Coppins building, the Hotel Covington, there's a historical plaque now in front of that building that's, that marks the original site of the hospital. It's moved many times over the years. 
1867, they moved to 11th Street. For a number of years, they opened an orphanage, uh, especially during and after the Civil War. They took in orphan children whose fathers died in the war and the mothers could not support the children. And the photos that we have, there's a few of them, of the orphans include both African-American and Caucasian children. So we know the sisters were taking in um, children of all races and creeds. Uh, again, just like the hospital, the orphanage was integrated uh, from the beginning. Um, the other great achievement of the sisters was their nursing school. They started the first nursing school in Northern Kentucky and for generations, women in Northern Kentucky who wanted to be nurses, whether they be sisters or lay women or lay men, um, most of them received their nursing certificates or their degrees from the St. Elizabeth School of Nursing. Um, and then eventually NKU and Thomas More started nursing programs, uh, but up and way up until through the fifties, um, the uh, St. Elizabeth School of Nursing was the way to get a nursing degree in Northern Kentucky. This is their original hospital on 7th Street. In 1867, they bought the old Western Baptist Theological Seminary on 11th Street. This is the, the original building. That's the Western Baptist Theological Seminary. They added the chapel to it. So this was not original to the building. Uh, St. Uh, Francis Chivier, the, the founder of the order, was, was in the United States when this building was dedicated. So she was, um, she was present during the dedication. So a saint uh, that was present during the dedication of the hospital. They eventually built the main Old North unit that we all remember uh, in a little bit south of Wallace Woods in that area of Covington. Um, so actually north of Wallace south of the Austinburg neighborhood, basically. So the old North unit that many of us were probably born in, including myself, um, thousands and tens of thousands of babies were born in this building, uh, including probably most of us sitting and listening to this today. This was the traditional habit. So this is a photograph of one of the sisters who was graduating from the School of Nursing. Her name was Sister Mary Frances de Sales Hart. Um, and you can see uh, she's wearing a white habit. Most nursing sisters wore a white version of the habit. Um, and so she's wearing white. Um, the, the one in the middle is, was the, uh, the actual uh, administrator. So she was running the hospital in, 19, in the 1960s. Her name is, let's see, Sister Mary Bernard. She was the administrator of the hospital. Now, we talked about women running school systems and how unusual that was. This sister was running a major hospital. This was unheard of for lay women. This would not have happened in the early 1900s or even the mid 1900s. This was not something that would have happened unless you were, were a nun. So these sisters who ran St. Elizabeth Hospital um, were given responsibilities that most women would never have been given. Um, because this was their institution. They funded it, they built it, they staffed it. At one time, there were over 38 sisters working in that building. The final picture is the opening open house of the South Unit. So it sees how the, you know, the, the hospital has expanded and is now, you know, a major healthcare provider in the greater Cincinnati area. All started by these three sisters in an old grocery store on 7th Street in Covington. And when they moved into this house in their annals, the annals are basically most orders had a book at each place they staffed and they recorded what happened in that, in that mission. So the annals of the hospital talk about when the sisters first moved into this building, it had been vacant for a number of years and they were talking about the walls moving. What it meant was when they pulled down the wallpaper to remodel the building, to turn it into a hospital, it was infested with bugs. So the bugs were behind the walls. So the walls actually were moving. Um, these sisters were um, started out with very limited means and what they've accomplished and what they have built that exists today is incredible. Sisters of Notre Dame, another German order. They came from Coastfeld, Germany. 
Um, in the 1870s, Otto von Bismarck was the chancellor of Germany. He was um, trying to unify, unify the German state um, as a, a Protestant nation. Now, many European leaders were doing this, both Catholic and Protestant. In Germany, Otto von Bismarck was trying to unify Germany. Uh, before 1871, no Germany existed. There was Bavaria, Oldenburg, Hanover, uh, Baden, uh, Hesse Castle, you name it, all these little independent countries. Otto von Bismarck, uh, under the rule of the Hohenzollern family, merged them all into what became today Germany. One of the things he wanted to do was to, uh, they all had a common culture, a common language. He wanted them to all have a common religion. And so he started putting penalties against Catholics in Germany. Uh, and he really went after the religious orders in particular. Uh, for instance, they could no longer wear their habits. Their schools were taken away from them. Their orphanages were taken away from them. And so many of these German nuns, these German orders, like the Sisters of Notre Dame, um, had to make a decision. Sisters of Notre Dame decided they were going to get as many sisters out of Germany and into the United States where they needed German teachers. They, did, they refused to give up the habit and they refused to give up teaching and hospital work. And so they just moved. Um, about 250 to 300 sisters were moved from Germany to Cleveland, Covington, Toledo, eventually California and other places throughout the world, Uganda even. Uh, but originally they came to Cleveland and then almost immediately to Covington. Um, they opened Notre Dame Convent and Academy on Fish Street in Covington in 1876. The one thing we had going for us in Northern Kentucky to get the Sisters of Notre Dame was our bishop. The second bishop of Covington was Bishop, bishop Augustus Maria Tebby. Bishop Tebby had a blood sister named Sister Modesta Tebby, who was one of these Sisters of Notre Dame fleeing Germany. So she came to Cleveland um, Bishop Tebby requested that uh, the sisters send some sisters to Covington to take over Mother of God School, um, and they did. They sent three sisters, and then they eventually sent many more. Um, a convent was established um, and an academy established. They took over St. Joseph Orphanage in Cold Spring. Um, they took over many of the traditionally German parishes in Northern Kentucky. And it's interesting, many of these schools have been taught by Franciscan sisters from Oldenburg, Indiana. When Bishop Tebby brought the Sisters of Notre Dame to Northern Kentucky, he asked the Sisters of St. Francis to give up those schools. And he replaced the Sisters of St. Francis with the Sisters of Notre Dame. The one school that was not, did not replace the Sisters was St. Aloysius. So up until the 1950s, the Sisters of St. Francis um, still were staffing St. Aloysius. Uh, but the other schools that they had staffed in Northern Kentucky in the 1870s were, and, and later were taken over by the Sisters of Notre Dame. So the Sisters of Notre Dame um, primarily were in German speaking parishes, German speaking schools, both rural and urban. So um, we talked about some of these um, St. John, St. Augustine Covington. They also had St. Mary's in Alexandria. This, by the way, is St. Julie Billiard, who is the founder of the Sisters of Notre Dame and their cousins, the Sisters of Notre Dame Namur. They are the French speaking order and they run Mount Notre Dame in Cincinnati. So there's Mount Notre Dame that's run by the French Sisters of Notre Dame and there's Notre Dame Academy in Northern Kentucky that is run by the sisters of the German branch, the Sisters of Notre Dame. They both have a similar um, rule that Sister Julie uh, started, um, and she's actually Saint Julie at this point. So you'll see on this map, uh, this is Montgomery Street, this is Fifth Street. To let you know, right here would be Mother of God Church. This is the axe throwing restaurant now that I always forget the name of. And this is the old Mother of God Elementary School. So Mo Montgomery Street runs into what is now this, this is a parking lot. This was the, this was the old Mother of God. So at Fifth and Montgomery was the original St. Mary's Parish, the first Catholic church in Northern Kentucky. 
the Sisters of the, uh, Notre Dame bought property and built the original Academy building, which was added on to three times, actually four. So you see one, two, three, four buildings, and then the chapel. So this was the original convent and Notre Dame Academy into the 1960s. Um, all of this was torn down after the sisters left to move to Park Hills um, and when, they, when the academy moved to Park Hills, except for the, the uh, chapel. The chapel stood and was part of a, a car sales dealership. So I remember this building very well. When they finally tore it down to build, this is the federal building on this lot now. When they built the current federal building, they tore this building down and they found the cornerstone and the sisters, the cornerstone contents were returned to the sisters, which was, which was nice. The sisters eventually bought this house and this was their music school. Um, but you'll see they had a large number of schools, again, mostly German parishes. Um, again, though, they were very much a part of the early Villa Madonna, Thomas More College uh, founding. Uh, they had a number of large um, suburban schools as well, St. Joe's, St. Agnes, um, St. Therese and Southgate. Uh, interestingly enough, the Benedictines had St. Therese and the Notre Dame's had St. Therese. Sometimes the order switched uh, depending on what was going on. Um, St. Clair Medical Center, the sister still uh, sponsor in Moorhead. So, um, uh, and they've been in the news lately for uh, their work with COVID patients. Um, it's amazing work that the staff are doing at St. Clair Medical Center. Oops, not one too far. Um, St. Clair Medical Center is, um, has been working over capacity for many, many months. They've had even the National Guard helping them out. Uh, the sisters are still um, very much involved and are the sponsors of St. Clair Medical Center to this day. Um, so um, wonderful work that the, the sisters are doing. They have the, the Notre Dame Urban Education Center in Covington as well. Um, now, all of the orders that we're going to talk about today had hospitals. Um, so the sisters of Notre Dame had Notre Dame Hospital in Lynch. They had St. Clair Medical Center. Sisters of Divine Providence, who we're gonna talk about in a minute, had several in, in the Appalachian area of Kentucky, Our Lady of the Way, for instance. The Benedictines had several in Kentucky and several in Colorado. Uh, Bishop Malloy was very big in hospitals and using hospitals um, and, and developing hospitals in Appalachia. And so he was requesting the nuns to the sisters to come up with, with hospitals and build hospitals. And they did it. Um, and it's very important to note during this time, the sisters were being paid very little teaching and nursing. Um, and their ability to manage money, to manage personnel, to manage funds, to manage property is incredible. And what they were able to accomplish and the buildings they were able to build and the institutions they were able to build is testament to their to their education, to their dedication, but also to their faith. You know, we have to always remember they were doing this to serve God and to serve the people of God. Um, and that was their major task. It wasn't, it, it wasn't to have the nicest building. It was to provide the best services to God's people. That was their driving force. And we always have to remember in these days and today, that is the driving force of the sisters we're talking about. This is the original um, Notre Dame Academy on Fifth Street. You'll see how it kind of developed over time. This was that music school I showed you. This uh, was all torn down. That um, con or the, the chapel I showed you sat behind, behind this building. This is the current Notre Dame Academy in uh, Park Hills across from Covenant Catholic. This is Sister Mary Agnetus. She was the principal of Notre Dame for many, many years. She was the impetus to raise the funds to build the new Notre Dame in Park Hills. She was the nun who famously wrote letters to wealthy people across the country and eventually got Conrad Hilton of the Hilton Hotel line to give her a half a million dollars. And then a little bit more later, I believe. That's why the road going up to the Notre Dame Academy is called Hilton Drive, if you've ever noticed. Um, Sister Agnetis was, uh, was a force to be reckoned with. She knew they needed a new academy and she found the money to build it. 
Uh, this is St. Joseph Heights, which was built in the 1920s, which was the mother house um, for the Immaculate Heart of Mary province of the Sisters of Notre Dame. Just recently, in the last few years, the Sisters of Notre Dame, the four provinces in uh, the United States have merged. So Cleveland, Toledo, Covington, and California have merged into one, um, one province called the Sisters of Notre Dame USA. They still are uh, part of the International Sisters of Notre Dame with the, the main mother house in Germany. The three sisters here are, uh, let's see, give me a second. Um, Sister Mary St. Clair, Sister Mary Judith, and Sister Mary Barbara Rose. Uh, the sister on the far side is one of the, the the modern sisters. This is Sister Mary Ethel, who was a science teacher for many, many years at Notre Dame Academy, much beloved by generations of um, students who went through Notre Dame. She's in leadership position today uh, at, uh, with the sisters and uh, is one of the sisters that I uh, very much admire and have been able to work with on a few projects. Uh, the sister in the middle, uh, almost every Catholic in Northern Kentucky can tell you the story of a sister that is related to them. This is my sister who's related to me. This is my great aunt, Sister Mary Dolorita, not Delrita. Delrita uh, was a, uh, a different sister. This is Sister Mary Dolorita, which is the seven sorrows of Mary. So um, um, Sister Mary Dolorita taught at the Heights for, or taught at Notre Dame for many, many years uh, business courses. Um, the, this is the original habit. So this is all pleats. So these had to be made every day um, or at least weekly, uh, usually by the younger sisters. These were all pleats and there's a machine you can still see at the heights of how they made those pleats. Um, as the order uh, and uh, as habits uh, changed, you'll see that changed. This is Sister Dolorita in a more modern habit. And then of course, Sister Ethel um, uh, in an optional habit. And she's, she's choosing her option not to wear a habit or not to wear a veil. She's, she's wearing a um, dress that a lay woman would wear. So, oops, oh, come on. Not being very helpful. Okay, Sisters of Divine Providence. 1792, they were established by uh, Father Jean Martin Moy in Lorraine, France. Uh, Lorraine is here. So here's France. This is Germany. This is Lorraine. Lorraine has been overrun by German and French armies so many times that the people in this area speak both languages. They speak French and German. Even to this day, many speak both. They're bilingual. Um, and so Bishop Mays invited the Sisters of Divine Providence to come to Covington. He needed sisters. Uh, to fill the growing number of schools being built, and he wanted to expand into Appalachia. And in one of the letters when I was archivist for the diocese, he wrote to um, the Mother Superior in uh, France. He said, pardon me for having to pass you off as a German. Um, he did not need French-speaking sisters in Covington. There were, there were very few French speakers. He had a lot of German speakers. And so he was, uh, the sisters, um, because they spoke both languages, could present themselves as being French or German, it didn't matter because they could speak both languages. And so the first parish they went to was St. Joseph Pan Springs, which was a public private, a public parochial school. It was both. Um, so it was a state supported parochial school. Those didn't last very long and were very rare. The first true parochial school, the Sisters uh, of Charity, uh, established in the, or uh, actually taught at in the United States is my home parish, St. Boniface in Ludlow. Uh, they came to Covington in 1889. They opened Mount St. Martin Convent in Newport and Mount St. Martin Academy in Newport. They came to St. Joseph Camp Spring in 1889, that combo school. They came to St. Boniface in 1890. They also started the Academy of Notre Dame uh, of Providence. Um, it was written in French over the door, which gives you a hint at their French origins. Um, most of you probably remember it as Our Lady of Providence. They ran afoul with the Sisters of Charity. When, when the Bishop Mays came, or Bishop Maas, who built the cathedral, he was, he was 
from Belgium. He was French speaking. Um, he had a great affinity for the Sisters of Divine Providence. When he brought them here, um, he wanted them to open schools in Appalachia, but he also knew that they would need an academy to help support their work because all of these um, orders that we've talked about, the academies made money because they charged tuition. The money from those academies was used to help uh, fund the other charitable work the sisters were doing. So keeping the poor schools open, um, some of the parish schools that needed extra help. Um, those academies were money makers for many years for the sisters. Um, and so when he brought the Sisters of Divine Providence to Newport, he told the Sisters of Charity who had Immaculata Academy already in Newport that he would not let the sisters open an academy. Well, this, the Mother Superior of the Sisters of Divine Providence or the Sisters of Charity in Northern Kentucky opened the paper one day and saw that a new Our Lady of Providence or Notre Dame of Providence Academy was going to be built in Newport and immediately wrote to the bishop and said, Bishop Maj, you promised us that you would not let them open an academy. There's not enough people in Newport to support two academies. Um, bishop May said, there's plenty of there's plenty of young women to support two academies in Newport. Well, there really wasn't. In 1932, Immaculata Academy, the Sisters of Charities um, uh, Academy closed and the primary academy in Newport was Our Lady of Providence. So um, this is Mother Lucy. She was one of the first sisters to come to the United States. She was one of the first three in 1889. This is uh, Notre Dame of Providence Academy, which became Our Lady of Providence Academy. I think it's probably one of the most, if not the most beautiful school building in Northern Kentucky. It's, it's a magnificent building built by uh, Samuel Hannaford and Sons. Um, just a, a, a spectacular building. Um, these are some of the sisters in their earliest um, garb. Uh, this is the teaching faculty at St. Boniface. And to give you some idea of uh, some, we, we tend to think of sisters as not having power or as if they were uh, always at the mercy of the bishop. That's not quite true. The sisters did have power. They used it very strategically. So at St. Boniface during World War I and leading up to World War I, um, the pastor was a German speaking pastor from Germany. He insisted that the children learn catechism in German. The parishioners did not want this to go on any longer. The war was going on. It was considered unpatriotic. The city of Ludlow actually passed an ordinance that it was illegal to speak German in public in Ludlow. Um, this happened also in Covington, by the way. So um, schools were getting rid of German language classes. The lo local library got the Kenton County Library, which was the Covington Library at that time, got rid of their German book collection during this time period. So the families were saying, please don't do this any longer. It's detrimental to our children. The pastor at the time refused and he took it out on the sisters because the sisters took the side of the parents saying we need to quit this he actually denied them coal to heat the convent. Um, the sisters finally used the power they had. They wrote to the bishop and said, we can no longer stay at the school next year unless father is no longer there. That got the bishop's attention. There weren't that many nuns. He needed nuns to stay at the schools. He needed those three nuns at St. Boniface. And so uh, the pastor moved the sisters stayed. The sisters lasted another 45 years in Ludlow until St. Boniface School was closed. So the sisters did have, um, they did have power. They used it very strategically and they used it when they really needed it. Uh, that was one example. Uh, the sisters had a lot of parish schools in Northern Kentucky, but I think the most interesting thing about them is they expanded greatly into the mountains. Oops, one, one too many. Um, they established St. Camellius Academy in Corbin. They were in Barberville, Cumberland, um, Jenkins. They had a hospital, Lynch. They were, I had a hospital in Martin. They were in Middlesbrough, Mount Sterling, Paintsville, uh, another academy, Pikeville. Um, they really expanded the church into the Appalachian part of the Diocese of Covington. And so 
one of their great gifts to the church in Kentucky was establishing schools and hospitals in Appalachia um, to, to a really uh, a great extent. Now, the one thing I think that's interesting about the Sisters of Divine Providence habits are, especially the earlier ones, is I don't know how they saw anything except what was straight in front of them. Their peripheral vision, if you see how far the veil comes out, their peripheral vision had to have been very limited. When they, um, when they modified their habits, they, the, the, I'll show you a photo. You'll see how they, they, how they actually ended up looking. So here's the modified habit where they cut way back on that. This is um, St. Anne Convent, mostly known for that avenue of trees, uh, that beautiful avenue of trees. Um, the sisters have planted another row behind it to replace these as they're dying. This is Sister uh, Monsueta Martineau. She was one of three blood sisters who were raised in Corbin at St. Camillus Academy. All three became Sisters of Divine Providence. She tells the story of when they planted these trees, each of the sisters who were able adopted a tree and had to water it three times a day with a bucket of water. <laughs> so um, when they planted these trees, the sisters had their own tree that they took care of. I think that's such a cool story. Sister died two years ago at 105. Um, so Sister uh, Mansueta was uh, a longtime member of the Sisters of Divine Providence. This is St. Camellius Academy in Corbin. This is kind of a, 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 a snapshot of the, of, of the habit. So this is Sister Georgia Marie. She taught for many years at Covenant Catholic and then at St. Xavier High School history. Um, I was at Covenant Catholic when she was there, uh, but I never got to take her classes because I was an underclassman when she left. She was the only nun on the faculty and we just called her the nun. Uh, it, she's Sister Georgia Marie, Messenschlager. Uh, this is Sister Loretta Marie. She's in the modified habit. Um, she was a English professor at Thomas More College for many years. And this is Sister Janet Bamberger, who is the current uh, administrator of Our Savior Parish in Covington, the traditionally African-American parish in Covington. The Sisters of Charity taught in Our Savior um, Elementary School and High School when the parish had those. They also taught in Lexington at the African-American St. Peter Claver grade school and high school and later at their uh, Montessori that lasted for many, many years. So Sisters of the Divine Providence um, worked heavily with the African-American population in Northern Kentucky. We're getting there. Um, Carmelite Sisters for the Aged and Infirm uh, were established in 1829. They came to Northern Kentucky in 1947 to establish a home for the aged. Uh, they purchased the Kramer home in Fort Thomas where they still are. Um, and um, they have expanded it many, many times. Um, they are dedicated to taking care of their missions. So we saw the other sisters missions, original missions were teaching and nursing primarily. The mission of the Carmelites was to take care of aged and infirmed. Uh, still there, still running Carmel Manor, um, a wonderful nursing home in, um, in uh, Fort Mitchell. Sorry, I'm gonna to have to go quicker. I'm running out of time. The passion is nuns. Now, there is a difference between a nun and a sister. A nun typically lives in cloister. A sister typically has an active ap apostolate. So a sister works out outside of the community typically. So they're a teacher, they, they work in social work, they um, are a nurse, they are uh, working as a chaplain uh, at the hospital. Um, so sisters worked outside of the, of the monastery, nuns or the convent, nuns tend to live, uh, nuns live in a cloister in a convent, meaning they only leave the monastery uh, for doctor's appointments and, uh, and other emergency kind of things. Uh, their life is dedicated primarily to prayer and uh, a way to make a living. Uh, the passionists make their living by making altar hosts. So if you're Catholic and you're going to communion, you're probably, um, that bread was probably made by one of the passionist nuns on Donaldson Road in Erlanger, originally part of the Marydale property. Again, they came in 1847. The current monastery was dedicated in 1951. 
Um, and it's a picture of the monastery and a picture of one of the sisters making toasts. Uh, if you've uh, ever seen, there's a, on YouTube, you can actually see uh, the process of how they make the host. Um, and so that brings us to Vatican II. Uh, there was a document in 1965 called the Decree on the Renewal of Religious Life. It has a Latin name. I'm not going to pronounce it because I'll butcher it. But it was a call to religious orders around the world to look at their original, original charism or their original mission. You know, what, what were they founded to do? What was their original purpose? And to go back to those, to study their original founding documents, to look at what their original purpose was and how they could live their religious life in the 1960s and going forward. And so the sisters took this very seriously, especially in the United States. Uh, all of these orders we talked about met they had many meetings, they brought in experts, they, they studied their founding documents, they voted many, many times on changes. Um, and, um, and it's interesting because during the 1960s, there was also the women's rights movement going on, there was civil rights movement going on, um, there was uh, the Vietnam War and the protests against it. There was lots of changes going on in the United States and the world and then Vatican II hit. And the sisters were faced with this challenge of how will we live religious life in the 60s and moving forward? And uh, most of the orders decided that um, they were going back to their original calling, which was working with the poor and neglected. So the Sisters of Notre Dame, for instance, when they were first founded, they did, they did have schools, but they also worked with poor children and took care of them and sick people in their homes. Um, and so they were going back to their original calling. The, the Sisters of Divine Providence originally went out into the country, countryside of Lorraine and, um, and catechized and worked with people in their communities. And so they went back to their or founding. Uh, the Benedictines, all of these orders were doing this. And so we start seeing changes. Um, less emphasis on working in schools more emphasis on working with the poor, underserved and neglected, those on the margins. Uh, simplification of rules and daily routines. Um, this is when we see modified habits and uh, many sisters no longer wearing it. So lots of changes. Um, but um, the sisters made those decisions as a community. They always made their decisions as a community. Um, sisters vote. They are part of a community and they, um, they, made the, they made the decision using consensus. They, they thoroughly um, reviewed the documents of Vatican II and they were very much looking at what the church was asking them to do and took it extremely seriously. Um, and so um, you can imagine though, that was a big shift. There was lots of changes and some religious um, felt that the life had changed too much. Um, some felt that it had not gone too far. Um, and so it was a time of great change in convents and in the communities. Um, one of the outcomes um, was, uh, actually, this is one of my favorite photos. This is a photo of the sisters at um, Holmes High School learning about Vatican II and about that renewal of religious life. So they gathered, you can see almost all of the orders gathered there. You can see the sisters with the white habits were, were uh, uh, novices or postulants. You can see here, there's some Benedictines, here's some Notre Dames, uh, chair, here's some Divine Providence. Um, I think these are Daughters of Charity, which were at the, um, would have been at um, Catholic Social Services. So you can see all the orders gathering to discuss Vatican II and to hear from Rome about the documents and about the changes and about you know, what the church was asking them to do. We did have, uh, uh, as we talked about, you know, some of the sisters felt that things had gone too far. Others felt that it hadn't gone far enough. There was a group of Sisters of Charity of Nazareth. Um, there were 18 of them who felt that the, the, re, the, the renewal, the changes had gone too far. 
Um, they wanted a more traditional lifestyle that they had been grown accustomed to. Uh, they wanted to stick with the apostolates of healthcare and education. Um, and uh, they approached Bishop Ackerman and um, asked for his sponsorship. Bishop Ackerman brought them to the Diocese of Covington. Um, eventually they settled in Walton. Uh, the leader of the group became the founder of a new order uh, was Mother Ellen Curran. Um, she founded the Sisters of St. Joseph the Worker along with Bishop Ackerman and originally 18 sisters. Almost all of them were Sisters of Charity who, again, they wanted a more traditional um, lifestyle that was um, a pre-Vatican II or that, you know, uh, in, they, they uh, were looking for a more structured life, perhaps you might say. Interestingly enough, there was a group of Ursuline nuns in Louisville who felt that their order was not moving fast enough. They left their order and actually joined the Sisters of Charity. So this was a time of great change in the world on all levels, not just in the church. So we talked about women's rights, civil rights, um, all, you know, the world was changing and the church was changing and um, sisters were part of that. Sisters are human beings. They, um, they are not perfect. They, um, they live lives like, um, you know, all of us do. Um, and they were finding their way just like everybody else was. Sisters of St. Joseph found a home in a new order that they established. They're still at St. Uh, William Convent in Walton. They also own uh, and operate um, St. Joseph Academy and um, uh, Taylor Manor in uh, Versailles, which is a, uh, a nursing home. So, and this is um, St. Joseph Academy in Walton, and these are a group of the sisters. You see they, uh, they wear uh, a more traditional habit. Um, they're uh, watching a parade. <laughs> this is in our Faces and Places database. So that's where I am. I'm gonna leave it there. Uh, I want to open it up for questions. I've talked a little bit um, too long. I'm probably a few minutes over. Anybody have any questions out there? Throw them out in the chat. Um, yeah, we have a question um, from Facebook that was um, from Dan Waller. It says, I hear one of the Duvenex stations of the cross is being hung in one of the Kenton County libraries. Do we know when? Yes. Um, the Duvenek stations were uh, painted by Frank Duvenek at that art institute by the St. Wahlberg Monastery. They originally hung in St. Joseph Church at 12th and Greenup. Uh, when that church was demolished, uh, the stations kind of scattered. Um, we were lucky enough to receive one of them. It, we have just had it restored. Um, we are, um, it will be hung soon. They were down there today hanging a few um, Duvenek etchings that had been, have been just donated to the library in Covington. So that one should be up, I would say uh, sometime in February. So you'll be able to view that station of the cross. Uh, there are two or three of them at the Curia in Covington across the street from the cathedral too, if you've ever been there on the second floor outside the chancery. Okay, and then um, we have a question from Kathleen Romero. Why was St. Joseph Church taken down? The, the parish changed dramatically. The number of, by the time the 1970s hit, the early, late 60s, early 70s, the parish was down to about 100 families. Um, it was a very large church. Um, it was a church that really, um, the, the parishioners could no longer afford the, to maintain it. Uh, the Benedictines were telling Bishop Ackerman that um, they really um, could not um, supply priests uh, much longer. And so the decision was made by Bishop Ackerman to, um, to do something with it. One of the plans was to actually turn it over to Our Savior Parish and make it um, the, the, to move Our Savior from their current location to that church. Um, after discussions, it was thought that the, the Our Savior congregation uh, was also very small and would not be able to maintain the property either. And so the decision was made to demolish it. Unfortunately, um, they, there was very little historic preservation during that time period. Um, the murals were painted on the wall, the altars, et cetera. Everything was just demolished with the building. Um, there was very little saved out of that building. Um, it's really a shame that um, work, more work wasn't done to save um, some of the things out of that building. 
Um, and the old saying is, once it's torn down, it's gone. Um, that's a good example of once it's torn down, it's gone. Yeah, it was a big loss. It was a beautiful church. Um, we have a question, if you could um, say who the three sisters pictured on the introductory page are again. Yes, uh, I have them, according to our records, as Sister Mary Felicity, Reverend Mother Anne Marie Birchmans, and Mother Antoinette Marie. And actually the name Marie is interesting because the CDPs, the Sisters of Divine Providence, because they were from a French era area, um, typically use Marie. So they didn't uh, like uh, the Sisters of Notre Dame, the Sisters of uh, uh, St. Benedict uh, were Marys. So Sister Mary uh, Burke, uh, Sister Mary Wendelin, um, Sister Mary Deborah. Um, the Divine Providence, especially in the early years were Sister Marie. So uh, Sister Catherine Marie or Sister Marie Joseph. So Marie being the French form of Mary. So um, just a, a little part of their history that makes them unique. Um, we have a question from Lisa Thompson. Uh, where can one find records of the orphanages such as the one run by the Sisters of the Poor of St. Francis? The, the, the records from the Sisters of the Poor of St. Francis um, for the orphanage do not exist. Um, we looked and looked today. The only thing that exists that even talks about the orphanage are the annals. We do have a copy of those um, at the library and the diocese has a copy. So if you wanna read those, we do have those available, um, but there are no specific records on that orphanage. I also get usually a lot of questions about St. Joseph Orphanage that was run by the Sisters of Notre Dame in Cold Spring and St. John Orphanage run by the Sisters of St. Benedict in Fort Mitchell. They're now merged in the diocesan Catholic Children's Home. Um, records for those are also, um, especially early on, are um, they're not very complete. Um, many times baptisms and records were kept in neighboring parish churches. So you can find some of those, uh, for instance, in Cold Spring at St. Joseph. Um, some of them are in, um, uh, the archives of the of the Benedictine sisters or uh, the sisters of Notre Dame, um, but the records, the earliest records are are um, are very scant, and the newer records, because of privacy laws, um, are not available or open to the public. So, um, unfortunately, I I would love to be able to send people to the Diocese and Catholic Children's Home but they're not going to be able to help you much if you're looking for genealogical information on individuals, either because of privacy rights or because the records just don't exist. Um, and then we have a question from Rick Rock. Did St. Joe's organ go to the cathedral? Yes, so if you're in the cathedral, uh, when they tore down St. Joseph, one of the things they did say were the stations that are, one of which will be up in, at the Covington Library, the, uh, one of the other things they saved was the organ. So when you walk into the main doors of the cathedral, if you turn around and look at the rear choir loft, you'll see a very small organ. Uh, well, it's not that small, but compared to the major organ in the cathedral, it's small. That's the original organ from St. Joseph Parish. It's a Matthias Schwab organ. He was one of the major organ builders in uh, greater Cincinnati, actually the Midwest. Um, he, uh, those uh, organs are highly prized and are beautiful instruments, uh, very well done. Um, it was moved um, by uh, Mr. Schaefer, who was for many, many years the choir director uh, of the cathedral. His children uh, fill that role today. So generations of Schaefer's at the cathedral uh, contributing to music. So uh, Mr. Schaefer, uh, the father, actually uh, had some students at Latin school and at the Villa Madonna College move that piece by piece from St. Joseph's choir loft to the cathedral where it was rebuilt uh, in the cathedral, rear choir loft. Um, so that's probably all the time we have for questions tonight. So I would like to thank everyone for joining us, especially the sisters who came. Thank you for joining us tonight. 
Um, I would like to remind everyone that the museum is temporarily closed to the public until February 12th as we take down our current holiday exhibits and prepare for the new art exhibits, um, which are Abracadabra by Greg Harper and Spirit Riders by Naomi Bradford, um, which are featuring paintings, drawings, assemblage, and collages from the late Bradford and her partner, which will run from February 12th until April 24th. You can find more details coming soon at our website, bcmuseum.org. Um, we are also always looking for volunteers and new members, so please learn more about that on our website. Um, thanks for coming tonight, and thanks to all of our sponsors and supporters of the museum. We'd also like to thank our staff, trustees, and members of the Barringer Crawford Museum. For more Northern Kentucky history through the week, you can check out our Facebook page, page in our YouTube channel where recordings of this and all of the past Northern Kentucky History Hours can be found as well as our latest installments of Curators Chat with our Curator of Collections, Jason French. Please like and subscribe. Um, as a reminder, there will not be a Northern Kentucky History Hour next week as we continue our bi-weekly schedule, but we will be back on for February 9th with Carl Leitzenmayer with Haunted History, Ghosts and Stories, and urban legends of Northern Kentucky. Um, until then, take care everyone and good night. Thank you all for joining us. And before we sign off, let me say thank you to all of you for being here. And it looks like I mispronounced Sister Janice Leia's name, which is weird because I live across the street from her brother. It's Sister Mary Janet Buker, who is the uh, administrator of Our Savior Parish in Covington. My apologies, Sister Janet. Thanks everyone, good night.